Alder Lake rockets off into space, cascading like a comet on coffee. At least, that's what it seems like after benching this bugger. So let's talk about the 12600K and what is probably the lowest cost mini ITX entry point right now and compare against the 5800X and the 5600X. Welcome to Machines and More. By now you've seen some initial benchmarks from the day one reviews. I did go and grab a retail version of the chip, so I'm a little bit late to the party, but what I wanted to do with Alder Lake was to add a little bit of real world color from a small form factor viewpoint. And what I'm gonna do today is show you what I think is the most reasonable way to get into Alder Lake for Mini ITX in an air-cooled Mini ITX system and do a like-for-like -like comparison against what I think is this real competition from a total platform cost and performance perspective. And then I'll share some of my thoughts on whether or not you should go for the 12600K. If you haven't seen Dave 2D's Alder Lake review, I'd recommend checking it out. It's a great review and in an NR200 no less. My favorite part of Dave's review was where he highlighted a decision that SFF builders are very familiar with. Yeah, you can put a 280 in your NR200 or your Sept Meshlicious, and yeah, with high enough fan speeds, you can tame power monster chips like the i9s during heavy multi-threaded workloads, but at the end of the day, what is that build gonna look like? So from a cost and SFF suitability standpoint, the $320 12600K is by far the most compelling chip out of the current Alder Lake lineup. So that's the one I really wanted to test. And even though the 12900K is simply going to have more multi-thread performance simply from a core count perspective, that kind of performance comes with enormous power draw. And at least speaking personally, I really like the simplicity of a build like this uh, 12600K build here. And for gaming, it's really not gonna matter all that much anyway to have those extra cores. For this build, I've set up the 12600K with the Gigabyte Aorus Z690 ITX motherboard, $290. It's one of the cheapest Z690 ITX boards that you can get now, although it is pretty early in the game uh, because it is a DDR4 compatible board. With Alder Lake, you will have to choose whether or not you wanna go with DDR4 or DDR5, but if you wanna go down that DDR5 route, that, that, becomes very challenging. The MSI board comes in at about $400 and the ASUS at $440, not to mention the higher cost for DDR5 RAM kits currently. So I don't see the value just yet and I have a hard time recommending that you spend that much on a motherboard for a $320 chip. On top of that, DDR5 still has some room to grow. It's clocked fast, but a lot of the kits have pretty high latencies right now. So it makes a lot of sense, at least for now, to stick with a high quality DDR4 kit now. And for this test, I'm gonna be comparing apples to apples and pairing the same RAM kit. This is the Crucial Ballistics 3200 megahertz CL16 kit. Very solid kit you can get for about $70 or $75 or so, and that works fine with both Ryzen CPUs and this 12600K, so the benchmarks will be with the same exact kit. So that puts the platform cost for a DDR4 12600K Mini ITX at about $685 or so, and probably the lowest cost entry point right now into 12th gen for Mini ITX. And to make it fair and real world, we'll be pairing all the chips with a Noctua U12A. Of course, the AMD chips get the original and the Intel, the Chromax, but they're essentially the same. And both setups are in an NR200 case. Dave 2D experienced cooler clearance issues with his air cooler on his board. And I had a similar issue with this board, but it was really because of this ginormous M.2 heatsink, which it's just total overkill. Uh, but good news, you can take it off. And if you need to, I just mount an aftermarket M.2 heatsink if you're intent on running something like this U12A on this board. Real quick rundown on specs, the 12600K is a 10 core chip featuring six performance cores and Intel's previous gen uh, core i5s going all the way back to eighth gen Coffee Lake were six core parts. These six performance cores offer up to 4.9 gigahertz on a single core with turbo boost, which is really, really fast. But the big architectural change here is the move to the big little concept uh, with four efficiency cores that can turbo up to 3.6 gigahertz. And at least conceptually, it's similar to what Apple has done with its M1 chips and also the new M1 Pro and the M1 Max. Those E cores do sound a little bit wimpy, but don't underestimate the work that they can do. 
3.6 gigahertz not too long ago was a pretty decent boost clock, right? So it's not exactly correct to just think of the 12600K as a purely six core chip. That being said, in a gaming scenario, as though it's E cores won't help you too much and your current titles, they really won't scale too well beyond six cores or eight cores anyway. So for the comparison benchmarks, you are gonna see the primary Ryzen comparison I'm going to be talking about is the 5800X. It's the closest Ryzen equivalent. Yeah, I, I know typically it would go up against Intel's eight core chips, but think about it. From a platform cost perspective, and as you'll see from the holistic performance aspect, this is the most direct Team Red competition. And uh, to add some color to this discussion, I also rebenched the 5600X. Everything is at stock auto settings to keep the comparisons simplistic. The benchmarks I'm presenting are from the latest update of Windows 11. Now, I did have a hiccup I experienced with the two Far Cry titles I benched. Uh, I'll explain when we get to that point, and um, yeah, it's a little complicated. But both systems share the same 3080FE graphics card. All right, let's start with some synthetic benchmarks. 3D Mark Time Spy, Intel leads the way here, passing the 5800 hex by quite a bit. The graphics score isn't very CPU sensitive, but at least you know none of these chips will hold back a 3080 here. Next up, everyone likes Cinebench, so let's check in on the R23 multi-core score. Wow. Just wow. Look at this. This thing is neck and neck with the 5800X. Now, the E-cores are still cores, right? And it clearly shows here. But look at that single core score. It's ridiculous. And I remember when Zen 3 first came out, we were all marveling at the performance, and here... Alder Lake steps it up to the next level. Geekbench 5 is not a high stress benchmark, but it gives us a good idea of how a system would function in the real world. Yeah, this chip doesn't play around. It's hitting harder than the 5800X, and this single core is absolutely no joke. And just a fun data point here for reference, Apple Silicon is to talk the town now, and yeah, this is a mobile chip, but hey, hey, Intel says don't count me out just yet. Against the 10-core M1 Pro with an 8P plus 2E setup, it does trail a little bit, but yeah, it absolutely mops the floor with it for single-core performance. For some real-world processes, I did a test in DaVinci Resolve 17, exporting a 12.5 minute long 4K timeline in 1080H.264. This is an area that Ryzen has beat Intel at when comparing, say, a Ryzen 5 to Core i5. And yeah, right now, Intel is playing with house money. In Blender's Pavilion Render, finally the 5800X manages to eke out a much needed win, but the 12600K is right behind it. All right, let's get into the gaming benchmarks. The 5800X and the 5600X are among the best CPUs you can get now for that purpose. So let's take a look at a few titles where the CPU performance really, really matters. And unfortunately, this is the one I hit a snag with. I started out benching with the 5800X and then a Windows 11 update came out. So I said, fine. And I redid all the benchmarks and uh, Windows 11 still being very iffy. Far Cry performance ended up being worse. So I do have to present the benchmarks as is, but I will footnote and include the initial 5800X benchmarks because it is much closer to the performance in Windows 10 and this is what I would expect with it. Far Cry 6, oh my goodness, it's Gus. Intel rockets ahead of the Zen 3 chips here. It does look like the two Ryzen's had a little too much Zafiro, but I am pretty sure once everything gets ironed out with Windows 11 that it'll be much closer. But that being said, 12600K is absolutely winning here, both in 1440p and in 1080. You can tell that the CPU is a limiting factor here because going down in resolution to 1080 really doesn't get you a meaningfully higher frame rate in this title. That's kind of the same thing with the older Far Cry 5. And uh, by the way, these are all AMD optimized titles. So Intel is playing in AMD's own backyard with this kind of performance. Continuing on with more CPU intensive titles, Watch Dogs Legion isn't the most optimized title. There's not much of a difference between 1080 or 1440. 12600K is slightly ahead here and with slightly more consistent frame times. Let's take a look at some titles where the CPU matters a little bit less and the GPU is typically more of the limiting factor. Red Dead 2, Ryzen has performed quite well here in the past, but I didn't expect this big of a gap with the 12600K. In 1080, the difference is quite astonishing. 1440p is also quite good with the 12600K and very good consistency compared to Ryzen. 
All right, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is very, very GPU limited. And finally, something where the 5800X can at least somewhat hold serve. Very small differences here. And this was a title where the 5600X beat the 11th gen 11600K. How about some strategy titles? Civ 6, yeah. Even here, the 12600K beats out the 5800X. However, come AI turn time, the 5800X does finally flex its muscle. To round things out, a title that I've been enjoying a lot lately, Age of Empires 4, finally a worthy successor to AOE 2. Yeah, I think that pretty much says it all. So Intel chips have gotten a bad rap in the past for power use, at least lately, but let's take a look here at some total system power consumption numbers. Other than idle use, the 12600K actually compares quite favorably and reasonably against the 5800X. And in fact, it is drawing lower power at stock settings for the all-core CPU render and not really meaningfully less, but you know, it's, it's not more in gaming. That rather reasonable power usage number actually translates quite well to thermals. And here with the fans locked to 1700 RPM, we're seeing very manageable thermals. And it looks like a U12A is going to have a little headroom for overclocking too. Now, I will note that the X570 ITX board does give the 5800X quite a bit of unnecessary voltage at stock settings. And that is something that the user typically needs to fine tune and you can do curve optimizer. But Realistically, for Zen 3 temps, like what the 5800X is exhibiting here, that's supposedly within design. But the big takeaway here is that cooling is not going to be a big issue for the 12600K. As for the core clocks during the all-core render, here's what things look like. The 12600K's P cores do run at a lower speed uh, for a stock all-core turbo. In fact, it is exceeding what uh, the spec was. Um, it's spec at 3.6, but we're getting 3.7 here. Uh, but yeah, those four E cores, they're actually quite a decent speed here still. Okay, thank you, AMD. This is a product of competition and the 12600K totally exceeded my expectations here and I'm quite impressed. I started testing this thing and I really tried to find something I disliked about it because it was doing so many things well. I was like, there's gotta be something wrong with it, right? But there wasn't and something just felt completely different compared to the recent gen Intel chips that I've tested. There really, really isn't anything I dislike about this chip. But should you get it? Well, I'll have a review coming up where we focus more on performance with a lighter weight GPU, which may be applicable for a lot more of you. But suffice to say, if you're running something like a 3080 or Radeon 6800 and above level of card, this is a really seriously compelling choice to pair with that card. And from the benchmarks that you saw, it either matches or flat out beats the 5800X uh, Windows 11 bugs aside, right? But that being said, if you are strictly gaming, I would still steer you towards the 5600X because of that value aspect. The 5600X is still going to be your lowest cost entry point for a high performance gaming system right now. That's $300. Plus, you could pair it with a cheap B450 ITX or B550 ITX board. So that comes out to be about $450, $470 for the board and CPU. And if a lower binned 5600 ever comes along, that value argument might get even more interesting. 12400, notwithstanding, of course. Uh, but if you are looking for both productivity and gaming performance, both the 5800X and the 12600K are very compelling at this point. And given that a 5800X plus the X570 ITX board as tested was about 650 and the 12600K plus Z690 board as tested was about 610. Now there's even a small value argument for the 12600K. Now granted the 5800X would work just fine with the B550 ITX board too, but even with platform price being equal, if you're building a new system right now, I'd choose the 12600K in a heartbeat. Plus PCIe 5.0 compatibility is ready for the future. Okay, things look pretty bright for Intel and AMD definitely woke the sleeping bear. Now there is a category of users that I wouldn't recommend upgrading, at least not just yet. And that's if you have an AM4 socket board already and it's not time to change motherboards yet and your CPU is still getting you along well enough. Uh, for that, I definitely recommend waiting to see how AMD's 3D cache refresh plays out. And then, well, 
you would still have your pick of the A5800X or just go ahead and do the old switcheroo with the new board, right? You'll notice that the Intel system was built up in the white NR200 and the AMD in the black NR200. And I wasn't trying to suggest that AMD was dark side. Uh, the Intel CPU gets the Chromax after all, right? But is AMD dark side or Intel dark side? Eh, I don't know. But to me, it looks a little bit like the Empire Strikes Back, but also I feel like Intel has been out of contention enough lately to have earned that prized rebel status as well. Either way, one thing is for sure, the force is strong in this one. And well done, Intel. This is some serious silicon here. With that, I'll wrap up this first look at the 12600K. I'll be doing another round of comparisons for those of you with more moderate GPUs. So please go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Links are down below for the CPUs tested and the setup. Thanks for watching today.